There we go. Erosion of rock and dirt, man. D1. Okay. Sharing screen. Yada, yada. Getting my pointer figured out. Laser, laser pointer. Okay. Here I go. All right, Adam. I'm going to do a countdown. One, two, three. All right. Hey, good afternoon, best practice workshop participants. My name is Todd Lohr. I'm a geological engineer. I work for the Army Corps Engineers in at the RMC, located in Lakewood, Colorado. And I'm here to give a presentation for best practices, chapter D1, which is part of the Embankments and Foundation series. And we're going to discuss the fundamentals, big picture overview of rock and soil erosion as it relates to dam and levee safety risk assessments. <clears throat> the general outline for the chapter, we're going to cover the overall ob objectives of D1. We're going to talk about key concepts, kind of take home take home points. And then we're going to go into the basics of erosion mechanics for soil and rock. We're not going to go necessarily too deep into all this stuff, just sort of get a big overview picture of what those processes, what the data looks like, what 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 thoughts you need to have when you're trying to solve these types of problems that have failure modes related to rock or soil scour. Um, briefly talk about modeling and, and model concepts and how they're applied to to the risk assessment and then we'll summarize with some takeaway points so overall objectives of this chapter are to give a general understanding to the participants of the principles mechanics the methodologies and the data requirements that's needed if you're if you're needing to assess the uh, the potential for rock and soil erosion. So a lot of these factors are going to be related to site conditions and geology, going to be related to the engineering materials of the subsurface properties. Um, and we're going to also cover on generally what are the input parameters? How do you get to the how do you get to the information that goes into the tools and the methods and models so that we can um, utilize those results in a meaningful way. So the overall purpose of this is not necessarily to calculate probabilities of failure relating to uh, rock erosion. This is more D, chapter D1 is the kickoff chapter for, for the overall series of foundation and embankment evaluations. And so the, the content in this presentation forms the background forms the basis, the underlying basis for a lot of the failure modes that get assessed as we move forward. So what we really want to do is learn how erosion assessments can be applied to when we're evaluating different types of failure modes. Um, when we start, so, so in future chapters, as we move forward through this series, future chapters will cover probability of failure due to erosion and this will be covered a little more in depth in spillway erosion, overtopping, internal erosion, riverine erosion, and hy hydraulic failure, and uh, oh, hydraulic failure of spillway shoots. Sorry, I read that wrong. So, so we're just given the the framework, the fundamental basics that will help understand and move forward into those chapters because they'll reference some of the key points that are made here. So, uh, key concepts to keep in mind. Many potential failure modes, different types of failure modes may involve rock and soil erosion that result in dam breach. So that means rock and soil erosion may be part of the failure mode, maybe a few nodes, or they may actually represent most of the event tree to some degree. But some of these failure modes that we need to be thinking about, you know, before we're heading into the risk assessment or during the PFMA and, and data review, we need to understand if we have an overtopping of the embankment issue that can lead to breach and failure of the embankment or lowering of the crest substantially. Uh, what if we have overtopping of concrete structure? 
where, where we get undermining of the footprint and then uh, structural destabilization of a concrete monolith or a weir or a, or a control structure of some kind. Um, is it possible that we have erosion of an unlined spillway or along a river channel along a levee? And then um, possibly we have erosion of a lined spillway foundation where the slabs are damaged or shifted or moved somehow, and that erosion can undercut and remove spillway slabs and migrate toward a control feature. So one other key feet, key concept that we need to take home is that initiation of ero erosion, just that first, that first piece of material being uh, detached and removed out of along a water channel path is not necessarily equal failure. In addition to initiation, of course, we have to go through a whole series of steps that include progression, continuation, maybe unsuccessful intervention, and ultimately breach. So a lot of spillways flow and have experienced erosion. Oroville is a, a classic example. It, it had significant erosion, and but ultimately it did not progress to a breach or a failure scenario. The, 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 res, the damming surface was not breached by the erosion. It was, it was close at the emergency structure, but it didn't occur. So, so just because we initiate erosion or we even propagate it a little bit doesn't always necessarily mean we reach a failure. And because, because erosion might just re reflect a couple of the nodes or a couple points of a failure mode, that means some significant technical and experience-based judgment needs to be applied when we're assessing erosion-related failure modes. So in, in addition to assessing the rock and the soil parameters and running models and seeing if it erodes, we also need to put that information in context with the rate of erosion, with the depth and width, of the geometry of the erosive head cut, uh, the location, where's it going to manifest? Where's it going to migrate? How How is it going to look as it progresses? Are there 3D effects that we need to consider? Does the dam have uh, design features in it that, that are defensive components that might help mitigate or restrict that, that erosion, erosion process? Is intervention possible? Um, the model and analysis results, maybe they're based on simplified methods or 2D methods, and we, we need to incorporate those results as a as a tool, as a piece of information to assess the failure mode ultimately. Um, what were the design assumptions of the original engineering team? And then this last one's important, warning times. How much time do we have? The one thing about some of these erosion failure modes is that they, they don't necessarily result in instantaneous or very rapid uh, loss of damming surface. They, they often evolve over time and, and we, we may have um, ability to react or interject and maybe slow slow down the process or remove people out of harm's way downstream by implementing an EAP. Okay, so the other component of this is that um, the erosion process has spatial, so 3D and temporal time effects that control and change the erosive capacity of the discharging water. So those those components of duration, energy, and geometry might all be relative to the hydrograph. So where on the hydrograph are we through the failure sequence or through the erosion sequence? We have to keep in mind the hydrograph and timing and where we're at. So let's talk a little bit about the erosion process. Erosion initiates typically when we have higher velocities and or higher increased flow depths over a exposed rock or soil surface where the particles of the soil or the rock are detached due to the shear stresses imparted on that surface. So those detached particles are lifted, pulled up into the water flow, or they're rolled along the stream bed, and they're transported away, creating a divot or a hole or a, or a anomalous surface. A lot of times when we're doing a field survey or a site inspection, we might want to go and look for adverse features along the flow path that cause the flow to concentrate and change the flow regime, meaning it makes a hydraulic jump from laminar to turbulent around or adjacent to or next to features that have differing 
um, geometries and concentrate the flow adversely. So these can be topographic breaks in, in, in the slope. These are nick points, changes in the slope grade, um, rock steps or rock ledges, swales or you know drainage reentrance. We might have obstacles in the flow or on the embankment slope, trees, boulders, vegetation, guardrails, utility poles, uh, piezometers, piezometers or inclinometer stickups might cause this to happen. We might have contrast in the cover material in the shape, the texture, the hardness, the strength of that cover material can change the flow dynamics. If it's flowing over asphalt to soil, soil to riprap, it's going to change its flow regime. There may be bare or exposed spots in grass cover. There's perhaps ground sediment over, for example, a utility trench where the flows can be can converged. And then cracking, there might be cracking in the asphalt road at the crest or around a bench or something, and that, that cracking also can divert or direct water flows. So this is a, is a slide that shows a typical head cut erosion failure sequence where we have some sort of flaw that exists in the protective cover. It's one of these things I just mentioned, some sort of topographic feature that concentrates flow and concentrates water and changes flow regime. These flow concentrates, increases velocity, thickness, and turbulence, and the particles of soil or rock in this case, or soil in this case, it might um, exceed the, the shear strength of that material and start plucking those materials out, carrying them downstream and into the flow. The, 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 the removed particles enlarge a hole or a, a scour area, and it slowly starts to advance upstream toward the crest or toward the weir structure, ultimately getting to uh, a crest of, of a dam or levee or up to the spillway where it can then breach the dam if the flows are if the flow capacity and duration is su sufficient all right so some of the erosion mechanisms that are going to be discussed in upcoming um, presentations this is a series of three three components that are are generally make up what what, what are called the erosion or this in the scour mechanisms so the first thing we need is we, we have to have a turbulence production. So that's basically the hydraulic jump. That's basically the, the, where the water is aerated, where it gains velocity, where its shear, shear strength, shear stress um, capacity increases. Um, I, I river raft a lot, and um, I was also on a project where we were talking a lot about these types of flows, these, these agitated, high velocity, aerated rapid type flows and uh, so we start calling it angry water so where's the angry water how angry is the water all those things are really important so we can get angry water because of the impinging or falling jet on a surface we can get it just across a, a ground sloping ground surface where there's some irregularities or some of those those anomalies we discussed earlier a submerged jet into a tailwater or a plunge pool can have enough energy to remove and shift and and break up rock and move it around. We have things called back rollers where where the plunging pool might have energy in an upstream direction. We'll talk about those a little bit more in a couple slides. And then we have the boundary conditions where on the sides you get the the back rotating eddies that can come in. So anyway, all these are possible areas where we have turbulence production or angry water is generated. Then we have to have particle detachment. The, the angry water has to have sufficient energy to overcome the resistance of the material that is in contact with it. And this can happen due to brittle fracture of rock or fatigue failure. It's block removal. So little parts of pieces are transported away out of the out of the rock mass or the kinematic structure. We can also have abrasion. That's where a larger particle is rolling or hopping along the base of the stream and it's impacting and detaching additional particles. So that can happen as well. And then the last part is we have to remove those. Those particles have to get shifted and flushed away and transport it out to create the scour hole that creates then the, the headward migration. So let's talk a little bit about 
back rollers and, and head cuts. What we're really talking about is perhaps we have a harder material, maybe it's a um, spillway slab and the water is flowing over, or this is a rock ledge in the spillway, right? You have stair steps or irregularities. Anyway, the water's flowing and it plunges over that. So we have a plunging condition where we're getting downward cutting, downward detachment of the surface um, by the plunging jet. But what happens too is the jet splits and it can roll backward to, toward the vertical face. And if it has enough energy, it can exceed the strength of that material and it advances that cut, advances that erosion upstream. And what sometimes can happen is if we have this ledge or spillway slab is it overhangs for some amount of time until eventually collapses and falls into the scour hole. And then maybe it's transported away and the process continues. But alternatively, if we have a hard, strong rock layer that's sitting there or the slab is is maybe it's reinforced and when it breaks, it breaks up into very large pieces. And when it falls down into this back roller area, it's possible that it armors that zone and it protects it and it dissipates the energy and it, it provides a little time or, or it reduces the erosion rate, the head cutting erosion rate. So, so we're doing a risk assessment. We need to make some judgments about whether or not our armoring is actually going to provide some resistance to the head cut or, or is it just going to get washed away downstream. All right, so let's talk a little bit first about rock scour, rock erosion. There's three primary components when we're talking about rock scour. First one is the erosive capacity of the flowing water. Where's that angry water? How angry is it? And where is it the most angry? And where is it least angry? Those are what the hydraulics folks, uh, you know, provide the, the geotechnical folks when we start having these discussions about where the water is most turbulent, where it has the most power, where, where it's the most aggressive. Then we have the rock mass resistance component. So this is how competent is the rock mass. And that comes back to a lot of rock mechanics principles. And then also another rock mechanics principle is the discontinuities. If they're oriented certain ways, they may be favorable or unfavorable to um, being plucked and removed. So let's first talk about stream power. Stream power is calculated as a rate of energy dissipation against the, the perimeter, against the, the surface that it's acting on. So there's a number of different configurations to, that we need to understand, um, you know, which one we're dealing with to calculate the appropriate stream power. If we're just having rock, if we're just having water flow down a uniform slope, then we might use an equation like this one where we have the unit weight of water, flow velocity, water depth, and then the, the energy grade line. Basically, that's the slope of the, of the surface. That might be in an unlined spillway or, um, yeah, that's probably, or, or, or along a slope or um, embankment slope, sorry for overtopping. Then the other condition is we might have a plunging jet. So the figure here is showing it coming over a dam, but this could be in, a, in an abutment where it's overtopping the dam, or it's coming into a, a plunge pool down at the bottom of the, of the dam, or this is a ledge. This is a rock ledge or a spillway slab that's overhanging and cantilevered. So when we have that condition of water falling into a downstream area, we might want to use the plunging jet equation. This is a function of you know, weight, discharge, uh, fall height, and thickness of the jet as it impacts the foundation material. And the last one is uh, calculating the energy from those back rollers that would form upstream of that plunging uh, water. And that's a function of weight, you know, weight of water, flow rate in the upstream direction, average flow velocities in the pool, and gravitational forces too. Okay, so there's a number of concepts and ways of assessing and measuring rock erosion. I'm only going to present a few of them here, and then we're only really going to talk about one in detail. Um, Ballert developed a computational model, a comprehensive scour model that's based on physics. It's a physics-based method that evaluates fra fracture propagation, block movement, it has functions for temporal effects, but it does assume that all the blocks are relatively um, uniform. They're cubic or rectangular in shape, and that the removal 
of the blocks is almost essentially in a lifting mode. So it's it's all from uplift on the sides and on the bottom of a block. So, so it has some limitations. George Annandale developed a semi-empirical method that was calibrated with over 150 field and lab case studies where he went out to erosion sites, looked at the rock mass, calculated what the stream power was, and then was able to derive a rock mass erodibility index and then compare that to the stream power. And that's the one that we're going to be talking about a little bit later. Um, the erodibility index and Dale method can be used in soil. And this case of H parameter is used directly in quantitative analysis of rock erosion. Mike George was a colleague of of Dr. Annandale and Mike went and learned about block theory with Dick Goodman at Berkeley and he started to apply this block theory concept of block removability um, and jointing and being able to predict which blocks were going to be able to be plucked out of a, of a flow. So he has sort of advanced the concept of the discontinuity and block orientation relative to erosion. And more recently, Pels in Australia, he developed a similar empirical method, similar to George Annandale, but he used a different um, rock mass classification system. He used what's called the geological strength index, which was derived by Hook Brown. Um, it's the Hook Brown rock mass classification system. So he used a different methodology. He still applies a discontinuity function, but it um, but it's based on different data set and he has um, little it's a little different application so gsi has got different applications than the rock mass erodibility index methods so i think it's exciting because it can provide some additional methodology to get to the the answers we need to assess rocks rock erosion um, the anadil rotability index case of h is the method that we currently use in our se toolboxes and that's what's also utilized in this course so that's the one we'll talk about a little bit. OK, so case of H to rotability index, the, the equations here, very simple, straightforward, not real, not real, nothing real complicated there. But it is based on Kirsten's ripability index. So Kirsten developed uh, some rock mass parameters that he looked at in the field and from lab data that he could then correlate to how easily it was to tear and rip through the rock mass. It's also based on Barton's Q rock mass classification system, which was designed for tunnels and tunneling and tunnel support, but it takes into account a bunch of parameters like RQD and joint condition and joint spacing and uh, and rock strength and that sort of thing. So Annandale combined those and to, to assess the rock mass resistance. So the M sub S is the intact rock strength. That's basically the UCS parameter with a density correction factor. The case of B parameter is basically the block size, right? How large those blocks are. If they're bus size, it's gonna be harder to remove than if they're size of you know a fist. So that's a function of RQD and joint number. <laughs> Rock quality designation. I just had a little brain aneurysm that I couldn't remember that. Rock quality designation, we get that from drilling, get that from scan lines, get that from field data, and then the joint number, number of joints. We do stereographic or joint discontinuity assessments. The next parameter is the case of D. This is discontinuity shear strength. So what's the strength of the sidewalls of that block? Are they rough or are they smooth? Are they polished? Do they have clay infilling or are they fresh and tight? So those parameters here represent the ground mass strength. And we have another function at the end, the discontinuity orientation function. This is, this is the orientation of discontinuity. Certain orientation of primary joint sets might be more or less favorable with respect to the water flow and the pressures that are injected into those rock joints. So at the end of the day, what we end up with is hopefully a head cut erodibility index for our rock mass or different parts of the rock along a spillway or different zones with depth, right? We might have multiple multiple case of H values in our spatial, you know, erodibility index model. And then we also get our stream power. And we plot all those up and 
ultimately it gives us a threshold of whether or not we think we're going to have erosion initiation or whether or not there's no erosion initiation. So this also can be uh, can compared to these probability lines that were generated by Weeblewelp, where we can have high confidence that we're going to have scour when we're way up high and high confidence that we're going to have no scour when we're below that green line. OK, let's move on to soil and soil erosion. There's multiple things to consider, multiple variables that we have to consider, and multiple data and sources that we need to tap to get this information. Of course, we need flow duration and the flood hydro hydrograph, velocity and depth. We need to have those parameters. What's the shear stress that's applied by the water on the on the surface it's flowing over? Geometry of the flow, material type, clay versus sand versus cobbles. Um, is there any armoring that can be generated? What's the vegetation cover? And then the soil properties, cohesion, particle size, density, water content, et cetera. Those all go into this K sub D parameter, which is the erosion coefficient for soil. So let's start with the shear stress calculated on the surface. The shear stress of the water flow can be compared to the critical shear stress of the material to determine if and when it will erode. In a channel or down a slope, this is the equation for a for calculating this critical or this water shear stress on the wetted perimeter. It's the weight of the water, hydraulic radius of the bed it's in contact with, and the energy, the slope slope grade. So when when the shear stress of the water exerted on the surface exceeds the shear strength basically of the of the material, then it's going to be detached and removed and floated downstream. So we get that parameter from a number of tests. So they, in the, in the testing apparatus, they apply, um, they apply a water jet, and we're gonna talk about this in a sec, apply a water jet until you get detachment, and then measure the rate of detachment over different shear stresses. And what we end up with is a slope of a line, and the slope, the ratio, gives us that K sub D parameter. So low K sub D is, high resistance and high K sub D is low resistance to um, to erosion. So here's like, like I said, some soil erosion test discussion. The jet test is exactly what it sounds. <laughs> you can get a sample from the field and have it in a vertical confined um, uh, structure, confined uh, placard, I don't know what I'm trying to say. And a jet is applied to the top of that sample over time at varying um, varying distances and varying varying energy levels. So we can tell what the what the shear stress is. We can calculate what the shear stress is applied to that surface. Then we can measure the deformation, how much was removed. And we can plot that on that previous plot. The other option is to do this whole erosion test, which is a little different. They take the sample, put it on its side, core a known diameter hole through it and then run water through it at varying rates and pressures but they end up with the same thing hole enlargement and detachment versus the applied shear stress and both of those go into these these k sub d calculations and so this plot is just showing us that the blue line here um, really reflects a general trend of k sub d the detachment rate and the shear critical shear stress they're inversely proportional and we get the same you know results from both tests the difference is jet tests are more appropriate perhaps overtopping and channel flow um, it can cover a wider range of soil i think my opinion is because the het puts the soil on the side and it's hard to drill a hole through for example a sandy or silty material without it without it collapsing um, and then wind dam, which we're going to talk about in a bit, is calibrated to these types of jet tests. Um, het slower developing erosion, more appropriate for small opening or um, even more clay or cohesive soils. There's some factors that we can consider when we're looking at soil erosion. One is the, the clay content and the moisture content. When the moisture content and the clay content are high, erosion rates and, and case sub D tend to be lower. So that gives us an indication of whether or not we're at higher rotability material or low rotability material. This slide quickly is an example of that, where we have 
low to medium average roadability matrix material supporting some class and gravels and that sort of thing. And then here we have maybe higher erodibility matrix material. So over here on the right, we see two dams, same flood, same geometry, same everything, except they're, they're composed of different materials. We have a clay gravel, high moisture content, high PI, uniform grass cover, probably is a very low probability of failure compared to the lower example where we have well compacted silty sand or sandy silt, uh, medium moisture content and uh, low PI to non-plastic and patchy grass cover. So those clearly would have two different um, probabilities of failure. The lower one would be uh, more concerning, I think. So let's talk a little bit about modeling and modeling of uh, erosion. Uh, the first thing is to get perhaps a 2D flow, perform a 2D flow study and get the estimated channel velocities and um, flow velocities, either over a dam embankment or along a spillway. These can be done using a uh, heck grass as shown right here. But the advantage of this is we can calculate velocities at lots of different points. We can compare those velocities to these general rule of thumb lookup tables and assess whether or not we have velocities that exceed our thresholds. Meaning, for example, a silty clay here might only have a, a seven feet per second Threshold, so we can tell if that's our condition that maybe we have a, a maybe we have an issue or we need to study something more. These velocities can also be um, converted into stream powers and then applied to the case of H, the the rock assessment erodibility parameter. All right, Windam is a soil erosion model built by um, Department of Agriculture and incorporates spillway erosion from from sites, another another model that they developed, and then it also uses some algorithms from uh, dam breach simulation, which is uh, yet another model called Simba. Um, you can route flows through the reservoir and supply an inflow hydrograph. We can examine the breach due to the overtopping of a homogeneous embankment and spillway erosion at the same time. We can evaluate breach development, how it looks, how it evolves. And then we can allow for variable crest elevations and enter multiple spillway scenarios. So that's pretty advantageous in the in that model. And here are a list of the parameters. This is an example of, of what the model outputs might look like. But of course, soil parameters are important. Plasticity index, particle size, density might be important. The spillway case of H parameter from, from the Annandale method we discussed can be entered for the stress equations. And then the case of D, the soil erosion coefficient, might be used for overtopping or soil erosion on a spillway. Uh, the embankment geometry, we need to import the slopes, slope roughness, Manning's equation, crest profile, primary spillway and, and any con conduit. And then we can add up to three alternative spillways too. So, so there's a lot of flexibility with this model. Um, vegetation cover, we need to have properties of that. Spillway discharge versus elevation information, tailwater rating curve, and um, the inflow hydrograph all get imported into this model. So things to remember is just rules of thumb. All models are wrong in some contests. They are merely a oversimplification of reality and we need to realize that they're informative. They're informing our assessment. They are not the answer. They're informing our judgment. Um, geometry and flow are as important as erodibility and other factors. More than one alignment may be necessary to evaluate. Input the model, inputs to the model will require data from multidisciplinary team. Erosion resistance with depth is important. So the spatial, the spatial variability of erosion resistance needs to be incorporated into these, make it as realistic as possible. Just because the model indicates there is a potential for failure does not mean that the model fails and vice versa. Run a full range of flows and uh, the duration is important. It all has to get tied back to where we are in the hydrograph. That's kind of why I, you know, the wind dam is so nice is that it, it accounts for the hydrograph throughout the erosion process, which is more difficult to do with the, with the Annandale method. Um, case of D and case of H can heavily influence the output. 
probably need to run sensitivity analysis and find what the what the parameters the range of parameters may be that we're working with. Assigning likelihood of initiation progression leading to failure takes judgment, interpretation of model results, and iterative um, work with multidisciplinary team. Everybody's got some expertise in different parts of all this. So here's a summary slide, erosion, key takeaway points. Many potential failure modes include progressive erosion of rock or soil to lead to breach. So that's many different failure modes might have nodes or components that relate to rock or soil erosion. So the rock and soil erosion isn't necessarily the entire failure, although it can be for overtopping and some spillways, but, but often it's just a couple nodes of a, of a failure mode. Initiation of erosion does not equate to failure or breach. Rock erosion is evaluated using the Annandale erodibility index. Typically soil is used Soil is typically evaluated using the critical shear stress in the K sub D um, coefficient component. Hydraulic studies are useful to determine erosive capacity of the water and maybe derive the distribution of stream powers over the, over the surface. And modeling and analysis tools can help estimate probabilities of erosion to breach, but it does require judgment, interpretation, and Make sure we're using it as a tool to inform our engineering assessment or risk assessment rather than using the actual results. So that is the end of my presentation. And I think now we can have some questions if and comments if necessary. Thank you for your time.